Okay, folks. Hello. This is Michael with the Reason RX podcast and our host, Melanie from Minnesota. Right. And Michael <laughs> in Texas. Doesn't rhyme. Yeah. No alliteration. Dang. Yeah. So, hope you're doing well today, folks. Um, this is my podcast number two. I talked to Jay earlier today and spent like three hours and 45 minutes on that and then had to jump into this one with very little time and preparation. Well, there's been some preparation, but these guys have like been patient enough to wait for me to get some stuff together. So, <laughs> so I hope you have enjoyed the show, folks. Have this, uh, okay, I'm tired. So I hope you have enjoyed the show so far, folks. Remember, if you could... Help out. Um, we could get Melanie some headphones so she can do some recording on her own and she can start wearing headphones. Maybe she doesn't want to because she doesn't want to mess up her hair. <laughs> we need some headphones that don't mess up hair. And, <laughs> and of course, you know, like we could be cool to have some recent RX podcast shirts, um, stickers, mug, coffee mugs. Um, be good to. You know, spread the show more. And again, if you like, uh, if you're liking the message in the show, if you could tell friends, family about it, parents, teachers, schools, um, hopefully this can help make a difference, help improve education, improve our own individual lives. Um, cause, you know, we want our children and our students to be living and thriving and happy. We got to look at that. Uh, holistically um, so hopefully these ideas are good and you're enjoying them have anything to add to that Melanie no I'm good that's awesome I think everybody gets that thank you cool we, we want them to support us because they value it yes and I think the culture needs it new ideas so um, <clears throat> excuse me so we're going to be talking to Scott Harris again today, and we're going to be talking about physical science. We introduced it, talked a little bit last time. Um, we have more about physical science and science to discuss, and uh, I want to, like, at first dig in um, to the need for this. Um, some people might think, who cares, or it's already being done, but uh, we've talked about education and science education and the need for this, but to give folks, give y'all more evidence, um, see some other people saying similar stuff, see what's out there. Um, I'll talk about some, I'll give some quotes from some people, talk about some organizations doing things. Um, so, you know, it's not just us running our mouths and yapping. Um, we know what we're talking about. Um, you know, we're professionals in the field. We know education. Scott, do you know a little bit about education? I do. Entering my 30th year. <laughs> Have you studied a little bit about the history of American education? Yes. Melanie, do you know a little bit about education? Yeah. Homeschool, music teacher, everything. Yeah. And you've studied some Montessori? Oh, yeah. Yeah. She's great. Yeah. And I've got a degree in philosophy, and I've taught for decades also. Um, seeing public schools, private schools, homeschooling, um, having a degree in philosophy. I know different theories of education, different theories of what it is to be a human being, different ideas about how the mind works, what thinking is, whether it's relevant. I've studied a lot about the history of science. Um, I've studied different sciences, some physics, chemistry, biology. Um, of course, physic, uh, philosophy is a science, studied math. Um, What's your degree, Scott? My degree is history and psychology, and that's where um, I come at this topic from is the history of science and the philosophy of science and the methodologies between the hard sciences and social sciences. Right. And um, if people hear philosophy and think what's relevant, then there's things we could do. And we'll discuss some quotes like uh, in the book Range. Some people talk about that. 
like I think it was uh, one person brought up in the book this book Range by David Epstein subtitled um, Why Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World it's Range colon Why Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World by David Epstein um, great book we recommend it maybe we'll have to have a podcast about that in the future um, maybe you can have him on but uh, we might have on someone he mentions in the book we'll see what happens um, the person said yes we just got to record the podcast that'll be a surprise but um, it should be a good episode but um, one guy I think it was he meant that David Epstein mentions in the book Arturo Casadevel you can look him up, major scientist at Johns Hopkins. Um, he has a H index greater than Einstein's. And an H index, um, I'll read from the great Wikipedia. If it's on Wikipedia, it's got to be true. It's a standard of truth. So <laughs> the H index, it says, the H index is an author level metric that attempts to measure both the productivity and citation impact of the publications of a scientist. So what he's done and how others view his work. So um, in the book Range, David Epstein said that, you know, I haven't checked it to verify. I'll like put it on him if it's wrong. Um, but you can, we can look it up ourselves. But um, Casa de Bell is an H index more than nine sign. Um, and Casa de Bell I think it was him, if I remember right, in the book, um, when talking about the importance of philosophy. Um, I don't remember the exact quote, but he said something like, um, who was had a greater in, intellectual impact on our history, the Greeks or the Romans? <laughs> who were the ones that were philosophical and who were the ones that dismissed it? Right? The Romans did some great things, but I think the thing Costa Devel, if it was him, might have said was that that is the thing that kept the Romans from being very successful. They didn't value philosophy or get its impact. Um, and I'll have to dig this quote up too, but uh, in one podcast I was listening to, uh, one scientist, and you can, you'll can you see the name in the show notes, um, he was giving an anecdote um, and it'll be more eloquent in the show notes so I'll just say what I remember so that when you read it you'll enjoy it more but um, there was a debate going on some discussion um, and um, I think Richard Dawkins I think it was um, said was talking about how um, he doesn't see a need for philosophy I mean he's a scientist all he cares about is the facts. And then the person telling the story says, and then some Frenchman in the audience, okay, well, so, sorry. So <laughs> Dawkins said, all he cares about is the truth. That's the word. He said, I'm just a scientist. I care about the truth. And then a Frenchman in the audience stands up and says, what is the truth? <laughs> <laughs> and the point is, for some, because it's a more abstract joke, it's more of a philosophical joke. The point is, what is truth is a philosophical question. You can't say you're a scientist and all you value is truth and philosophy doesn't matter because that is being philosophical. And that is a philosophical, not a scientific question. What is truth is philosophical. What some particular thing is, whether it's right, that is a scientific question. And the, the methods by which we arrive at the truth and to find the truth is purely philosophical. Yeah. Um, if we say epistemology is a branch of philosophy dealing with validity and truth claims and how we know something is true, there's a lot of reasoning that, that goes on with that. And then we develop scientific methods and controlling variables and so on. But science and philosophy have been inextricably linked yeah. for Linea, and um, I'm surprised to hear Dawkins say to, to dismiss it. Yeah, um, I was too, but 
that's the way some scientists are. Um, and, you know, it's big in physics nowadays, too. Too much of a dismissal of philosophy. But I think one thing it'd be interesting if someone to write a book or go back and study, um, it'd be interesting if they'd look at the causal relationship between philosophy and science. And so you could look at when there's no philosophy, what happens? When there's philosophy, what happens? But you could say good philosophy leads to good science. You find that out, and you'd find out bad philosophy leads to bad science. So that would really reinforce um, the conclusion. Instead of just philosophy or no, you know, you can see a causal relationship between good philosophy and good science and bad philosophy and bad science. It is in the history. It is in the books. It's there. Um, it'd be nice if someone would write a book about that. Um, and then to differentiate between the sciences. You know? <laughs> That's purely philosophical. Or what does is, what is physics study? It studies reality. Sorry, reality, or an aspect of reality, and that's a philosophic issue, not a is issue of physics. What is there? That's not a physics question, that's a philosophy question. And then sometimes for sciences to develop, people have to, like a scientist might function as a philosopher to come up with a new method of knowing or proving something, and then they can go back to doing their science their physics or whatever um you know and if people would know more of the history of science you know they look at a lot of them will take physics for granted nowadays but if you look back you see that uh at some point people had to function as philosophers and be outside of some fields and unite physics and math that is not done quote unquote as a physicist that is done as a philosopher identifying that the two fields can be united and math can be used in physics to measure things and to help prove causal relationships it's not merely deductive I think some people have pointed out how Newton used math to identify and prove causal relationships not just to deduce stuff or what about, like, realizing that one can integrate chemistry and physics and biology and geology? <laughs> you know, sorry. <laughs> you got to step back and be philosophical. You know? Or if we're buried in a physics thing and we can never get out of it because philosophy doesn't matter, how the hell do we apply technology to things? and meet a human need, you know? But, um, we'll maybe talk about that more in the future. That'd be good for some discussion. But, I wanted to develop that point a little bit since I brought it up. That was, uh, segueing off what we, I wanted to discuss at first, but, as we all know, it's an important point I think we need to address and say a little bit about. Did you want to say any more about it, Scott, before we move on? Well, I, I like the direction you're going as far as things need to be more interdisciplinary. And I think universities have really discovered that within the past decade or so. And we're seeing more and more uh, interdisciplinary projects. Stanford uh, is, is doing quite a bit of that. Um, a lot of, in the social sciences, a lot of um, economics departments now have PPE degrees uh, politics, philosophy, and economics, hmm. because the solutions need methodologies and contributions from multiple fields. And so the same, I think, is true with the hard sciences, that there's gains to be made, especially for the students, if they can draw on several different fields, yeah. rather than keeping knowledge in their little silos. Right. So... Um... As I say, we want to talk about some physical science today. Those are important points. We've got to develop more in the future. Um, and we'll be talking, I think, a little more about that later today. But just to let, finish letting people know about the importance of uh, science education and how it does need to change. Um, 
we need to talk about physical science and address this issue because what we've been doing is not being successful. There's different factors at play and different things we've got to look at, but first of all, evidence. Do I know what the hell I'm talking about? Well, yeah, because I've taught for a while. Scott has. I know we can... I'm not going to read them because it would sound arrogant, but I have testimonials I've, I've gotten from students that talk about how what I teach them has an effect. They're still using the thinking skills 10 or 20 years later. I'm not just doing math and then they never use what I teach them again. To, quote, to paraphrase Victor Hugo, if I was teaching only for this test, I would break my pencil and throw it away. Like Victor Hugo said, if I was writing only for my times, I would break my pencil and throw it away. You know, I'm working holistically with students, teaching them thinking skills. So I, I don't, I'm not a math tutor, but I am a logic thinking coach, let's say, that uses math or physics or fitness to teach someone how to think and how to function better. You know, we want optimal functioning kids. Um as adults and we want them to do well in life because they got to be groundbreakers no matter what they do if they're breaking a new field but regardless they got to be brown groundbreakers in their own life because they're living something that has never happened before this is a unique life this is a soul this is a thing a work of art they want to create and i want to help them and so does scott and melanie we want to help students create this work of art that's going to be their life you know, like I say, like sometimes, like, writer of zero books. Well, yeah, because I don't give a damn, because look what all three of us have done in, like, crafting souls that make a beautiful life, a beautiful piece of art. I don't need to write any damn books. It'd be nice to someday. You know, books are good and all that, and I appreciate people who write good books because I learn from them. But the point is, I got this other stuff. You know? You talk about a qualification, there's some qualifications for you. Same thing with Scott and Melanie. Fist bump. Bam. So, um, you know, we know from our own personal experience, the success students, success students have, we've studied the history of science. We know mistakes that have been made. We know the history of education. We know the good and the bad. We know what to do. We know what's happened in our own life. Um, that's important, but here's some other stuff. Okay. So, um, let me give you some quotes um, quote science students learned the facts of their specific field without understanding how science should work in order to draw true conclusions unquote rewind and listen to that again that's from the book range how generalists triumph in a specialized world by David Epstein um, and E.O. Wilson, the great biologist, he wrote also a book, Consilience, about how all knowledge is integrated. Um, it's Consilience, the Unity of Knowledge, E.O. Wilson. Quote, few scientists are philosophers. Most are intellectual journeymen, exploring locally, hoping for a strike, living for the present. Unquote. Journeyman? What the heck is a journeyman? Well, if we look that up, if I can find my browser, I'll give you an actual definition. But um, where did my browser go? What? Okay, but a journeyman, could y'all look that up? Please. Yeah, I got it. Oh, there it is. I just, like, okay. down, put it thingy. Do you got it? Yeah. Oh, do you want me to? Should I thought I you got it. Up? Oh, no. I just found my browser. I'll look it up. Journeyman. Journeyman. Definition. Oh. So. Oh. Um, a worker. So this is. Uh, um, not a technical definition. There's also a technical one. But. Um, okay. Here. The technical one. Historical. Journeyman. Is a trained worker. Who is employed by someone else. And in the great Wikipedia. A journeyman is a skilled worker who has successfully completed an official apprenticeship qualification in a building or trade. 
<clears throat> they're considered competent and authorized to work in a field as a fully qualified employee, but they must work like that's what they say, unquote. But then they got to work under a um, like a master. So you got apprenticeship, journeyman, master, and then as a result, the development of the term colloquially, colloquially would be a worker or sports player who is reliable but not outstanding. And I think E.O. Wilson probably means the historical thing about a trained workman. Um, but so that's what he is saying about many scientists. I'll read it again now that we've looked at the definition of journeyman. Um, there it is. Quote, few scientists are philosophers. Most are intellectual journeymen, exploring locally, hoping for a strike, living for the present. And this isn't to criticize or to insult. It's like we want people to be better. This is evidence of what the education system is like now. These are quotes by people who have studied this and know what they're talking about to show that we're right about what we're saying about science. Um, and in terms of some people who specialize, if they don't get philosophy, um, quote, I dove into work showing that highly credentialed experts can become so narrow-minded that they actually get worse with experience, even while becoming more confident. By David Epstein, and again in the book Range, why I have here I have wow why is it how why journalists triumph in a specialized world or how one or the other. So it'll be in the show notes. Um, so let me give you one more. Um, okay, now again from Range, um, how journalists triumph in a specialized world by David Epstein. Okay. Because of Arturo Casadevel's accomplishments, remember he's the one with an H index more than Einstein, and I can like link to him in the show notes. Quote, his peers took it seriously when he arrived at the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health in 2015 as chair of molecular biology and immunology and warned that scientific research is in a crisis. In a lecture to his new colleagues, Casadevel declared, that the pace of progress had slowed while the rate of retractions in scientific literature had accelerated. Part of the problem, he argued, is that young scientists are rushed to specialize before they learn how to think. They end up unable to produce good work themselves and unequipped to spot bad or fraudulent work by their colleagues. Unquote. Mm. To repeat, quote, young scientists are rushed to specialize before they learn how to think. Unquote. Okay, and then we got, look up, um, Rice University. Have y'all heard of Rice University? Uh -huh. sure. is, it, is it any good? Yes. Very good. Very good. Okay, Rice University, Engineering Leadership Program. The mission of the Rice Center for Engineering Leadership is to educate and develop and inspire Rice engineers to become ethical leaders in technology who will excel in research industry and so on. Um, it enhances traditional undergraduate education by developing skills that are not expressly covered in the traditional curricula of the School of Engineering. The goal of the program is to equip engineering students with the critical technical communication and leadership skills necessary to succeed and excel professionally. Right, so again, the traditional curricula does not teach people thinking skills. So they have to have a special program to do it. And it's good they recognize that and they're doing something about it. You know? That shows integrity. It's a, what? It says in 2019, Rice University is ranked of the of best colleges as 16, hmm. number 16. Wow. Yeah. And it's about 47,000 to go there. I yeah, think. it's a private school, I think. Yeah, it's a lot. It's here in town. Yeah. I mean, you knew it was in Houston, right? Yes. Did you know, Melanie? No, no, I didn't. That's why I looked it up. Yeah, it's like... I've heard about it a ton, but never knew where really... Huh, I don't yeah. think you, it's like, so. what, 4,000 miles away from you? <laughs> yeah, that's probable. Yeah. I'm sure to see it someday. <laughs> when my kids go there. <laughs> yeah. and, um, and then, okay, so we've got the quotes from David Epstein. We've got the quote from E.O. Wilson. Um, the thing about Rice, okay, 
um, John Hobson School of Medicine. Is John Hobson School of Medicine any good? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, John Hopkins School of Medicine. Um, title of an article, Revolutionizing with R3. A new PhD program seeks to train scientists as critical thinkers. Um, they have to train them to be critical thinkers? What does that imply? <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, not to like insult them. Everyone has to be trained to be a critical thinker. I sure didn't like pop out of my, like, like my mom, <laughs> critical thinking. <laughs> we got to learn how, you know, I had to learn from other people. So it's good they're doing that. But the point is a lot of people aren't learning to be critical thinkers. So, which is a whole other podcast right there yeah. to talk about why. Yeah. And then they can right. refer to, um, what we've talked to Andy Bernstein about so yeah. far. Um, we have more I mean, to discuss more, more upcoming, but let's like start among others in our other podcast. But it says here during graduate school, it can be easy to get lost among the tomes of information that we all must memorize in time for our exams. But that's not just graduate school, that's high school and that's undergraduate too. I mean, is it, it's common knowledge that a lot of stuff is just regurgitate and forget, right? You know, um, are you, are you just BS on a essay? Um, so to continue quote, this background knowledge helps fuel our research and lets us know what topics have already been explored so that we have an idea of the path to take in our own thesis research. But educators at the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health assert that memorization alone does not a scientist make. Above all, students must be critical, creative thinkers who are honest and responsible with data. In order to train scientists as critical thinkers, unquote, what does that imply? Quote, the R3 Graduate Science Initiative was recently created, yes, in the Department of Molecular Biology and Immunology led by Director Gundula Bosch, sorry if I didn't pronounce the name right, PhD, in order to better train graduate students to understand their work and create a community of responsible scientists, the program centers, centers on the following. Rigor of experimental design, responsible handling of data, reproducibility of results. That's the R3 thing. Based on her experiences as a PhD student, Bosch is familiar with the trials of the traditional program structure, the sometimes cyclical pattern of experiments that fail and the stimulating success of an assay that pushes us forward. More recently, Bosch's training as an educator showed her the importance of critical thinking, a skill she realized is rarely formally taught, unquote. Okay, let me repeat that again in case people didn't get that. Quote, a skill that is, she realized is rarely formally taught. Or maybe that's not enough, unquote. So, quote, showed her the importance of critical thinking, a skill she realized is rarely formally taught. Okay, do you get it now? Okay. And I hear you saying, or, or what that paragraph is saying is, in science, we've left out all these philosophical things and we need to reinsert them. Yeah. Logic, ethics, epistemology, those are all necessary components. Yeah. And then it'd be good to read the book Range because it's all about the importance. And so it's consilience. It's about the importance of integration. As we said earlier, um, physics and math, um, integrating two fields that were regarded as separate. Well, and let me read this line. We've mentioned this before. Uh, C.P. Snow in 1959, he was... Uh, a British scientist, but also a novelist. So he lived in both worlds. But his famous lecture called The Two Cultures, and I'll read a paragraph from, from it that's pretty famous. His complaint was that, kind of like in college, you go Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Science, and we split into these two separate worlds, and we don't really have a lot to do with each other. So he says, good many times I have been present at gatherings of people by the standards of the traditional culture are thought highly educated and who have with uh, and who have with considerable gusto been expressing their incredulity at the illiteracy of scientists. Once or twice I have been provoked and asked the company how many of them could describe the second law of thermodynamics. The response was cold. It was also negative. <laughs> I, I was asking something which is a scientific 
equivalent of have you read a work of Shakespeare's? He, and then to finish, he says, I now believe that if I had asked an even simpler question, such as, what do you mean by mass or acceleration, which is the scientific equivalent of saying, can you read? Not more than one of the ten highly educated would have felt that I was speaking the same language. So the great edifice of modern physics goes up, and the majority of the cleverest people in the Western world got as much insight into it as their Neolithic ancestors had. Hmm. So he's certainly criticizing literary types for not knowing much about science, but mm -hmm. I think the bigger part of his lecture is pointing at that in the 20th century, we've got increased specialization. And this specialization is good, it brings a lot of achievements, but these fields have become increasingly from each other. And you broke up a little bit. Increasingly, what? Sorry. The fields kind of have increasingly pulled apart from each other and into their own little silos. And again, the reason for the interdisciplinary movement, I think, we're seeing as a reaction to that. Yeah. And so, again, read the book range, please. That addresses this topic about how that's um, not ultimately productive. Um, you know? You got all these people doing all this stuff and all this research, and um, as it points out in the book range a number of times, it's like a lot of research is like they're not even sure if they're just doing if what they're doing is true. It's like they're just doing stuff, they're just sciencing, so to speak, experiment. Well, one, one interesting thing, if if young people are thinking about you know jobs in the future and that kind of thing. Obviously, if you're in love with chemistry or physics or something like that and want to pursue that field, there are specialized uh, things to do within that field. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Yeah. But the, the more common type of job out there, especially in the leadership positions, if it's a CEO or a manager, is do you know enough about science to talk to hardcore scientists and then yet the personnel department or whoever, can you kind of, as you're talking about that, that book range, can you speak the language of all these different departments? That's the person who ends up overseeing a lot of things, making a lot of decisions. And that's where that interdisciplinary and general liberal arts education uh, really comes in handy. Yeah. And then if people really want to be creative in their field, they can't get it by being hyper-focused the book range again in other areas too. It's like, I knew this before the book range ever came out and before I read it, but it's good to have this book where a lot of it's put out there for a lot of people to read. But, um, creativity comes from bringing other areas together. So a, a good scientist or engineer is to be able to talk to other people to get ideas. Where did Darwin get the idea for evolution? Studying geology. You know, where did William Harvey get the idea for circulation? Y'all know? William Harvey studied circulation. He was able to measure it. You know where he got the idea? I'm going to remember when you tell me. <laughs> Reading Aristotle. He huh? read Aristotle. And I think he was talking about the water cycle. And he saw how things went in a cycle and the sun was like the heat that kind of drove it. And William Harvey looked at the heart as like the sun. And huh? the sun would drive like the water cycle, just like the heart would drive the circulation. And then he actually measured it. He used math, um, you know, to prove it. So integration right there. I got other stories in my head. The only problem is, you know, sometimes it's like you don't always pull something out. Sometimes you key your memory and your mind and brain to start remembering things. And then it starts pulling things out and some stuff comes out like, two minutes later and then the next day like five things pop up and you know how that works yeah I was going to ask Scott if he thought he could give some tips to parents and people that are you know educators to help kids get kind of ready for where there seems to be a deficiency there's something that's gone terribly wrong how can we catch this before it's too late I mean never, maybe it's never too late but it might be <laughs> Yeah, it depends well, on the person. If I could do it, I mean, when I graduated high school, I was so pathetic. I couldn't, I didn't believe something unless I read it and someone else said it. I was such a second hander. 
it took me a lot of effort and work to figure out how to really think for myself and learn logic. And if I can do it, then anybody can do it. Well, my single best tip, uh, you're not going to like, <laughs> uh, because I think we need to radically redesign schools, especially high school. Um, you know, in elementary school, there's a lot more interdisciplinary learning, and then we get away from it. And I think maybe we need to go back to that. Um, you know, I've always taught at public schools, and they've all been pretty large schools. It, it, that, in part, forces how you have to teach. When I first started teaching um, and was single and didn't have kids, I didn't do my first multiple choice test until, I don't know, 10 years in. I mean, the final, they always made us do multiple choice, but I, everything we did was short answer and short essay because you can really teach thinking a lot better than the memorize, regurgitate, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so if we, you know, I've tried to do some interdisciplinary initiatives at my school with a physics teacher, a Latin teacher, and a math teacher. But it's you're just swimming upstream. That's not how schools are designed. And, you know, we, we did some things, but nothing earth shattering. Nothing that's um, stuck. Yeah, but it, you can't, you know, the system is so entrenched in how it's set. I, I think we'd be better off with uh, schools that are at least half the size of big ones. I, and, you know, if you go too small, then it's hard to get teachers trained in the field. But, uh, so that's a completely unhelpful tip. But, <laughs> but good to know. But yeah, but it gets people thinking in a different direction, you know, because and if we just throw more money at the schools, it's going to solve all the problems. <laughs> uh, I'm just being, you know. Yeah, well, we just get better funded versions of what we already have. Well, yeah. 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 <laughs> But I would, uh, as far as what an individual parent and kid could do, um, there are often, if you live in, in a big town where there's a university, there are often lecture series um, in the science department, in the philosophy department. Um, I would go to lectures, and, and really the topic even doesn't matter so much, but you get to see some world-class people talk about interesting problems. Mm -hmm. um, that's a form of sharpening and improving your thinking. Mm -hmm. but yeah and then I like your point you know it's good for people to remember you have to like specialize just do it properly so if you want to be a physicist or something um, you have to specialize and know certain things but the point is not to do only that and hyper focus you got to be um, the way I like it, I put it is uh, we're all specialized generalists generalist being the noun specialized just being an adjective we're essentially generalists but we do specialize in things and other people have put it in different ways through history i'm not the first one to see that of course but like uh um what's it science fiction novelist some people like um forgot the guy's name now but yeah he said something like um specialization is for insects i've heard that yeah yeah Every human, every person should know how to change a tire, cook a meal, um, romance a loved one, um, plan a war, engage in a battle, um, all this other stuff, you know. So, and then it's I, Robert Heinlein. That's it. Yeah, thank you, Heinlein. Right. Good old, good old. Yeah. And, and if you look at. You look at famous scientists like Robert Oppenheimer and, and others, they often have what some in the science community might think are esoteric interests in other languages or in art or whatever, but they're constantly drawing in creative insights from those non-science things that they do um, and sometimes even have figured out formulas and such from the non-science angle. Yeah, and actually, Range actually brings that up explicitly how that's important for their creativity and function. And then, um, I don't know how much you know about uh, Richard Feynman. Um, I've read some books by him, and 
um, talking about some stuff he's done. And yeah, he was like, you know, he's, he's got a Nobel prize in physics and he's known as a great physics teacher of the 1900s, but, um, he played the bongo drums. Um, he did experiments on ants. Um, I don't remember. Oh, and I think in the movie infinity about him, he, there's a scene when he's at Los Alamos and some college graduates come in to help do some uh, research and he's showing them how to use one of those old computers with the cards. And so he says, this is how it works. And he puts some cards in and they run through and he's such a freaking genius. He gets these like, you know, there's these like five by 11 cards or something, whatever they used to use with holes punched in them to like have the computer crunch numbers and stuff. And that's how they used to do them. And he was such a genius. He runs those through and it plays a song. It's like Mary hit a little lamb or something, you know? It's like, how the hell did you do that? Where did that come from? You know, you're expecting this thing, computer to happen. You have no idea. And all of a sudden the song plays. It's like, there's genius, you know? Or like Galileo. People know about Galileo as a scientist, but he was a musician. I think if I remember right, his father was one of the ones that started modern opera. And um, Galileo, I mean, what? math, astronomy, physics, but he was also a musician when he was at the end of his life and he was going blind because of some of his studies of the sun and all that, looking at it with his eye, he'd still play the violin. And some of the stuff, some of the stuff, some of the experiments he did at first, he'd roll a ball down an inclined plane. When he was doing some of that, he, because he, he was able to do some of that because he knew music so well, he knew how exactly how long it took to make some syllables when you were singing. And so he'd sing from what I've heard when this ball was going down and he could see how long it take, it would take to go from like one place to another. And he could measure it that way. And he'd put some strings across it and he could tell by like maybe calling it out in his head or singing out that this took a second. And so he'd move the strings until the certain segments of song he can repeat, blah, blah, blah it hits a string, blah, 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 it hits a string and he moves the strings to see that the, the longer the ball is rolling down, the further apart the strings need to be. And then because he knew math, he was able to see that that was a semi parabola. The, um, how the distance varied with time was like varied with the square of the time. He also did uh, watercolor paintings in huh. his notes, his science notes. He would paint little, I didn't know he did watercolor. I thought it was sketching. Wow, it's cool. And of course, you know, that reminds me of like Michelangelo, all the stuff he could do. Or Da Vinci. Da Vinci. Yeah. And, our, and one of our former podcast guests, Bernd Hein Heinrich, Heinrich, he yeah. does his own um, sketching and drawing and stuff. Oh, yeah. and it's some of them. Yeah, really pretty. Really nice one. Yeah, and he's like not just a nerd scientist. It's like, jeez, right. it's like um, you want a renaissance man all around. <laughs> it's like, yeah. you know, some people go into the gym and think they're tough. Sorry. Baron Heinrich <laughs> hangs, hangs, um, by one arm, um, from hundred feet high in trees, but for a purpose, he doesn't do it for no reason. He's up there studying biology. He wants to look at a bird nest. The only way is to hang from a limb. <laughs> <laughs> he climbs trees. He's like a still, you know, in the like top 10 for American, like records for 50 and 100 mile races. Mm. Running. Yeah. Um, so that's important. It's like people can read the book range and get more insight and evidence about what's going on and how it's important. Um, you get ideas. You're more creative and productive when you can bring these other things into play and you don't just hyper focus on your own field. When, when you mentioned, Scott, about maybe enrolling in a college course as a you know, parent, and maybe if your kids are a little bit more um, mature, they could join you, possibly, you know, sit there with you, and you can take the course together, and it depends, I know. But that reminded me of a, a gentleman named Leonard Peikoff, who's got a lot of contribution to the world of philosophy. If anybody has ever heard of him, um, they should check him out, because he's got so many things. I, I 
really have to say I respect the guy a great deal. So we'll put a little bit of show notes in the show notes. Okay, I'll look him up. What are some of the stuff, things he's done? Well, art of thinking, history of philosophy, like part one, part two. Maybe there's more in that even. Um, he, so, yeah. And just what about know, any other got, fields? Like grammar or history yeah. or art or anything? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and and yeah. I mean, he's got just like what? What does he have like in art or grammar or anything? Or is he just a philosophy guy? No, I don't. Um, he's got um. There's philosophy of education. I'm looking at his site here. Um, Unity of in epistemology. I mean, a writing a mini writing course. How to write well. Um, Introduction and in, index sorry induction in physics and philosophy introduction to logic Yeah, I would recommend checking him out if anybody wants to not have to maybe tool over to the college But you know see a bit online and eight great plays as literature and as philosophy. Oh, oh, interesting. Yeah I did his writing course. Oh, did you? Huh? <laughs> well, cool. What did you think of it? Did, Oh, it, it was good. Um, it was 20, 25 years ago. Oh, okay. Hmm. That course has been out, or, or at least the version of it. Well, that's good, Scott. You'll walk the walk and talk the talk. You're studying the philosophy, too. And it's not <laughs> just like, I'm a teacher with a degree in psychology and degrees in psychology and history who recommends philosophy. You've actually studied it. That's good. And, yeah, so, you... and that's good. Like, you bring them up. People need to study philosophy like that. And so there's some. What were you going to say, Melanie? I was just going to ask if he was familiar with his dim hypothesis. I haven't delved into that too far yet, but I just wondered yeah. much yet. Not yet. Yeah. I'd like to check mm -hmm. that out. Well, I... Another one. E.O. Wilson is some good philosophy and logic, and Leonard Peikoff does. Um, so, cool. But... Uh, so we got to get more into some of the solutions. Hopefully, you know, we've talked about some stuff that people can do, not enough, but wanted to make sure we have, we're providing enough evidence and facts mm -hmm. and discussion of the state of modern science education, physical science. It does need to improve because it is not doing what it needs to do. There's all these people have pointed out there's a lot of failures, like Casa de Bell saying that the rate of retractions has increased. And um, I think that I didn't get it down in the quote, but he was also saying something like to be a to have a scientist joke, because, you know, about if the rate of this continues, you know, he said, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't put yeah. that part down. <laughs> he said the um, the rate of good science is decreasing and the rate of retractions is increasing. Yeah. And at this rate, by 2020. <laughs> But so, yeah, all these schools are putting things, you know, some programs into play. Um, they're doing the best they can. Um, you know, still, I think there's some things that can be improved because um, there's a lot of mistakes in philosophy and, and logic and the philosophy of science. Um, it's not merely saying philosophy is good. It's like, as we pointed out, if people would look back and look at good philosophy and what it leads to and bad philosophy and the science it leads to, that'd make for a great book. And it'd be a valuable contribution contribution to our society and to history and to thought if it was done. And, you know, people, um, it'd be a contribution, but even better if people like read it and spread it more, put it into practice. But um, so um, what was I going to say? Um, my brain's like getting hungry and tired, so it's turning off. But yeah, we got we talked about a lot of things that you know evidence that there's some problems. Yeah, and then I was going to say, so they point out that philosophy is needed, and we got to study philosophy, and then critical science. But you know, we got to think about what the hell is critical science? Critical thought, I mean. We need logic and critical thought, but what is logic and what is critical thought? There's still mistakes there. Just because someone says, yeah, we need to do logic or we need to teach critical thinking, well, what is it? Um, people can make mistakes there too. Um, there's like mistakes, like the all too common thing about thinking that 
induction is only possible or hypothetical. If it's deduction, it's 100% rock solid true, but if it's induction, ah, it's probable. Nonsense. That is a philosophically and really invalid idea. Induction is not uncertain. You can have certain inductions, and that's one thing among others that we need to get right to really have science take off and improve and to know what the hell induction is. Because a lot of times it's just based on like an idea of deduction. You know, you just, they try to scheme out and model induction on deduction, but it's not. It's its own thing. It's much richer and more important. And when we flesh out what induction is, flesh out what concept formation is, we're going to be better off. And I think that's one thing I notice um, a lot of mistakes people make are not having the concretes that define the scope of a concept or not knowing what the concretes are that define the scope of an induction. It's like divorced from each other because of Plato. It's like propositions and inductions and generalizations and concepts are all airy-fairy and different than the concrete things. And that severing of the tie just undercuts and destroys thought and science. Then we're not thinking about reality anymore. So that's one thing that really needs to be done. That's an important aspect of science. It's like, I'd like to bring that up, you know, when we're talking about, talk to um, Dr. Bernstein again. I wanted to say it last time, but it didn't fit in. But I think that's an important thing that needs to change in American education if it's going to be done right. Um, academics have to be done different. They have to be not done platonically. But uh, if people... You know, and more research needs to be done on how the inductions occur. Like people get, because of the bad ideas, people think, well, um, th there's this Kuhnian stuff and paradigm stuff. It's a bunch of nonsense. And um, we, they need to see that there are certain concretes Newton used to form his theories and his propositions. And then what science would do to expand it has to see, okay, can we extend the scope of those concrete things and still fit it in this concept, or do we need a different concept? Is it the same or different? Can we extend the scope of this theory to include subatomic things and things going at the speed of light or not? You know, because of the nonsense ideas, people think, oh, there's a paradigm shift that shows Newton's wrong. Nonsense. You know, Einstein developed from Newton, and he's not shown wrong. Things are developed. It's like, what is the actual scope of this idea? And then Einstein didn't come along and say he was wrong. He said, okay, um, if we're going to include these other things, um, we need to have different propositions or concepts that encompass them all. And then we're going to have a much more fruitful science when we can do that. Do you agree, Scott, or do you disagree? I'm all for fruitful science. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> Apples and oranges and, and I, yeah, tomatoes. Just, tomatoes are fruits, too. The last thing I would say, and, and we're back to methodology, is some of the problems we're having in science, uh, in psychology, um, with being able to replicate um, known, yeah. including famously known experiments, and it's back to methodology, and that in part is philosophic um, with epistemology. Um, and it's, it's, it's a big problem in a lot of fields. Yeah. Uh, not to mention p-hacking and, and researchers running multiple hypotheses till they find one that's statistically significant <laughs> and then kind of building around that one because that's how you get published. That, again, isn't a science problem. That's a human problem. And an ethics problem, and so we're back to philosophy. Hmm. Yeah, good point. Agreed. And the stuff I was saying is philosophy too. Concepts, induction, proposition, that's not physics. That's not chemistry. That's not psychology. That's philosophy. And and that's largely absent from science classes in high school. There's no discussion of yeah. uh, philosophy, even methodology a whole lot. I mean, certainly they cover the scientific method, but I ask my students, you know, in my philosophy class, I was like, what, you know, what do you talk about methodologies and, and 
you know, the history of science is almost absent. Again, you'll get more of that in history class than you will a science class. Mm -hmm. And yeah, everyone needs it, not just scientists, literature people. Everyone's got to, everyone thinks any human being who uses concepts, you know, the whole point, like, you know, of what we're doing here is addressing the fact that we're holistic, just as we talked about with Jay earlier today. I did. Um, when some people try to look at only strength and power when they're exercising, they like speed and power, that's all they want. Then mm. they're flawed athletes. They are um, injured, undercut, limited, flawed. Um, same thing here. Like we need logic to be a full person. Um, like, yeah, you can kind of sort of, we can kind of sort of do some stuff like just being physically fit and kind of sort of knowing some stuff. But what we really want is an optimal life. We want to live and survive and thrive. And we want the best for our children. And so we need to help them to develop fully. One aspect of that is the rational mind. You know, we got fitness, we got the social aspect, we have different subjects we need to know, we need to be good at observation, um, some things like that. But then, you know, one thing to be a full human being, because of our nature as rational animals, we need to know some basic logic, a little bit about concepts and definition and induction, everybody. And that's one thing that would help a lot. Um, and that would help people do critical thinking a lot better than just the deduction stuff that's usually taught as critical thinking. But, um, and that's philosophy. <laughs> so, yeah, so... Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> and, you know, we want what's best for our kids as we talk about. It's like our students, our children, we love them. We want the best for them. So if, if we got to be a little self-critical, then so be it. Um, or allow other people to be a little critical of you if it's for the best. As long as a person's not being an a-hole, of course. But if it's for the best and we see that this can really help, then we should take it to heart and take it to mind and do something about it. Um, what do y'all think? Do you think? What do you think, Melanie? Yeah, <laughs> you agree? <laughs> I do. I do. So it's, it's like, another topic for sure. We we can keep going, but I know we'll have to stop. So. It's not that you don't want to. You couldn't say it better yourself. It's that you could, and you just don't want to embarrass me in public. So, well, never been one to show up. Any, yeah, yeah. I think um, we should ask if Scott has any final thoughts or words before I think we so close. Too. Let's take a vote. A vote, yes. <laughs> On what tips for? I mean, just to final words before we go. I guess just to sum up what you're. I, I I would just say for. You know, and this is what I tell students when they complain a well, lot. I have to take chemistry or whatever. <laughs> and, you know, teachers always lie and say, you're going to use this the rest of your life. And you're not unless you go in that field. But that's not why you take the course. It is teaching you to think differently. You are going to get gains out of all courses. Mm -hmm. uh, and you may not appreciate them until later. And, and that's usually not very motivating at the time. Uh, but any of us who have been through school can look back at things that we didn't think were useful. Um, but certainly science courses are going to make you a more systematic thinker. That alone is worth the value of taking a science course because you're going to approach your daily life and the things that you do in a more reasonable, thoughtful way instead of acting on the yeah. Right. Yeah. And then I'd add, like... Um, Another way to look at it, like you could say, maybe you're never going to use it, but um, you could also say, well, that's your own fault. Why don't you like dig into it, actually use it because it is useful. That's why it was developed and invented. So dig into it and quit expecting someone to 
spoon feed you and take a little responsibility and learn how it's useful. Yeah, you've taken that tone with my kids. You know, you're their science teacher. And at first they're like, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, it's valuable. I mean, parents aren't saying that to their kids, I don't think. Yeah. I mean, no one ever talks seriously like that with kids. They're worried they'll get hurt or they'll, it'll turn them off, you know, to various whatever topic. Yeah, I think it's a great, it's yeah, a great honestly, way. And I, I don't know if you would say it like that yourself, Scott, in class, but and I think I've earned it because I don't just say that and never tell them how to how we do anything. I'm like up and down, left and right, inside and outside, backward and forward about how it's related to reality and how they're going to use it. Yeah, so yeah, you back it up, but I don't know that yeah. Scott would quite. I mean, in a school yeah. setting, that might be a little. I don't know. I'm not sure. How do you? Huh. Yeah, I don't. I don't disagree because, yeah, we we sometimes have this idea and people, even certain administrators, encourage it that we need to make things entertaining and exciting. <laughs> and, you know, the scholar Jacques Barzin said, um, excitement's not a great state to learn in. <laughs> there is there is a certain amount of drudgery and some, some groundwork one has to do in any subject before it starts to get really interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we've got to be able to, you know, hold our attention long enough to get to the good stuff. Yeah. Who said that, Scott? What's his name? Jacques Barzun, B-A-R-Z-U-N. Oh, okay. I just wanted to get that right here. That's a very cool quote. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, and then uh, one thing I like to say to some people sometimes, too, is, uh, like, make a distinction. Sometimes something's boring because the teacher is boring. Um. It's an interesting subject, and they're totally boring. Sometimes it's the subject, but you know what? Sometimes it's you. Sometimes you have to take a little of that. So yeah, you got to take some responsibility. It. It's like if someone's curious, then they mm -hmm. dig into things and they're involved and intrigued with the world. So sometimes the problem with some people thinking something's boring is because they have no curiosity, and that's what needs to be fixed ask questions if a teacher is boring ask some questions um, a, a class is boring usually because there's no interaction and it's just the teacher talking mm -hmm. uh, but the minute kids get involved one or two all of a sudden it, mm -hmm. any subject will get a lot more interesting mm -hmm. and then maybe a student or their parent or some teachers instead of just complaining about the teacher they're so boring why don't, why don't you try to help them Offer some ideas. Say, you can do this. Yeah. I really like what you're doing. There, like, there's some really value here. I think this would make you a better teacher. Stuff like that. Mm. You know? Like, let's help each other out a little bit here. You know? Yeah. But, yeah. So, um, cool. So, hopefully we got it established that, yeah, there's... We want the best for our kids, but... And we're a lot of teachers are try, trying really hard, but some of the methods are clearly not there. And there's a lot of evidence we just adduced, a d d u c e adduce, a lot of evidence we just adduced to verify that point to prove it. Hopefully, we take it seriously and do something about it. We gave you some ideas. We'll talk more about it in the future. Um, about flesh out more about what we mean by concepts and induction and what people can do. Um, but hopefully it's clear that the interdisciplinary um, training is really important not just focusing on one thing um, that's a big problem with a lot of science and taking philosophy seriously good philosophy um, so anything else guys Nothing. Cool. We covered it all. <laughs> yeah. So. So much, Scott. The I'll say that. The whole, the Thank whole. you for taking the time. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thank yep, you. So right. yeah, Have appreciate it, again. Scott. Yeah. And that was Scott Harris again, folks. I think we said that at the beginning, but the name will yeah. be up. It'll be in the title. Everybody, and if you don't know Scott, then catch up. Where you been? You can, you can look back at previous podcasts that you should have been All listening lives. to. Yeah. <laughs> Scott, he's I've like, so he's like an honorary co-host. Yeah. 
very, very good one. Yes. For sure. Thanks so much yeah, again, Scott. So, yeah. we'll, we'll be talking to you soon. So we right. hope you enjoyed it, folks. Hope you enjoyed the podcast. And again, if you want to leave us a rational review, leave us a good rating to help get this up in the rankings and make more people aware of it on the podcast and the apps and let teachers know about it, please. Let parents, homeschool parents know about it, school administrators. Get these concepts spread in the culture. Um, it would help us each a lot and it would help the culture. Um, and any other words, Melanie? Good night. Good night. Cool. All right. Thanks again, folks, for listening. And yeah, if you can make some donations too, that'd be cool. Melanie can have some headphones. <laughs> All right. So thanks for listening, and we will talk to you soon. Bye.